So I'm going to solve this problem. It's kind of a common problem that you'll see in a lot of classes uh, that pulls together multiple ideas about magnetic fields and induced current and uh, changing current. So let me, let me explain the situation and then I'm going to go ahead and solve it. So right here I have a wire and this wire has starts with no current on it uh, in it and then there is a current. I didn't put the direction. It's going that way. There's a current going uh, up that way and it goes from 0 amps to 1.5 amps in a time of 0 0.05 seconds. I just completely made up these numbers. Okay. I didn't even, I just, I don't even know if they work or not. And near that loop, near that wire is a square loop with a resistor in there, which I didn't give the value of. I'll just go ahead and say that uh, R equals 100 ohms. There, I did it. And so what's going to happen is that because there's a changing magnetic field in this loop, there will be an induced current in the loop. There's actually an electric field there. And from that, we can find uh, the EMF over the loop. And from the EMF, we can find the current. So that's what we're going to do. So there's really two big ideas. Number one is this one. This is the magnetic field due to a long straight wire. Um, I derived this in a previous video. So if you want to go look at that, I'll include that down below unless I forget. And then you're going to have to just Google it. Uh, and then, so this says that the magnetic field due to a wire, it does not give the direction. Okay, because the direction changes, it makes these circular patterns. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it depends on mu naught over 4 pi, which is a constant. Uh, 2 is the number 2, and I is the current, and then R is the distance from the wire. And then this is Faraday's law. This is the most important thing. This says that if I take this loop and I integrate E dot DL around that loop, normally that would be 0. The change in potential would be 0 around the loop. But this is not true if I have a changing magnetic flux. So this is the magnetic flux through that same area right here. And that's the time derivative of that. Okay, so if, if I have a constant change in current, then this is really just a, I don't even have to take the derivative, but I'm going to do it anyway as a derivative. And then we'll just deal with it from there. Uh, okay, let's just get started on the problem. I'm going to turn off this camera right here. And let's get started so let's just think about this conceptually if i have a current i2 going up and then i can calculate or describe the direction of the magnetic field so if you put your thumb in the direction of the current your fingers show the direction of the magnetic field so over here i have a magnetic field going into the board into the paper and then over here it'd be coming out Right, so I, I use X's for arrows going in, uh, dots for arrows coming out. Uh, so that would give you this circular pattern, but we're flattened down into this uh, plane right here. Now, can I just calculate the magnetic field? No, I can't because the magnetic field at this distance is different than the magnetic field at this distance. So I'm actually going to have to calculate the magnetic field as a function of distance uh, right here. This is going to have to be an actual integral. So we're going to need to integrate over this. Um, yeah. So once I do that, then I can take the derivative and set that equal to this. Uh, let's go ahead and E, this is going to be the change of potential around the whole loop, right? So I don't really need E. I just need, I can say this E dot DL is going to be equal to, technically that'd be negative delta V. And then I can set that equal to uh, I loop times R and solve, that's the Ohm's law, right? And solve for I. Now, again, that negative sign doesn't really make sense because I, I don't have a vector direction for I. We'll talk about the direction of the current in a little bit, so we don't have to worry about the magnitude right there. So the first step, though, is to calculate the flux through this due to some current right here. I don't even care what the current is. I'll just call it I as a function of T. So let's do that first. So let me redraw my picture. So here I have I as a function of T. It could be anything. And I want to find the flux through this loop. So the flux, the magnetic flux, is going to be the integral of B dot n hat dA. Now, this is pretty easy because B is, I already said, was into the page, and n hat is perpendicular to that area too. So B and n hat are in the same direction. So B dot n hat is just a magnitude of B. So I can say this is going to be equal to B dA. Now, 
I need to break this into pieces and over which I can calculate that B dot D. I can't do it now because the magnetic field changes. Remember B wire mu naught over 4 pi 2i over r. So let's break this into a piece, a rectangle like this. And I'll call this the, uh, let's call this the x direction. And so this is going to be a width of dx. I can calculate the flux over that piece. I can say d flux due to just that piece is going to be, in this case, the magnetic field doesn't change this way. It only changes this way as I get further away. So I can calculate the flux. It's going to be the magnetic field at this point, which I'm going to call it uh, B as a function of X uh, times the area, which is going to be equal to, I said this was a distance S, and this is a length of H, and this is R1. So this is going to be BX times DA, but the area of that is going to be equal to S DX. Now I can go ahead and put in an expression for B as a function of X, where I'll just put X instead of R. So I get this. The differential flux through just that little piece is going to be equal to this, mu naught over 4 pi, times the current to I, and I is a function of T. Right? But it doesn't change the space, so I can just leave that as i. That's i as a function of t, uh, divided by x, and then I have s dx. Okay, now this only has the only variables in here that would change as I move to a different little piece are the x and the dx. Well, the, the dx my differential. All this other stuff is a constant. That means I can integrate both sides, and I can get the total flux. So the total flux. It's going to be equal to this stuff, which is a constant, mu naught over 4 pi, 2i, s. The in integral from x equals r1 to x equals r1 plus h of dx over x. So what's the integral of dx over x? Well, if I had x to the negative 1 and I add 1 to that, I get x is 0. So you can't use the power rule here. And so you should probably remember that this is the natural log. So if I integrate this, I get mu naught over 4 pi 2i s. And then I get natural log of x evaluated at r1, r1 plus h. Okay, so this is very important. You would, don't want to ever just write the natural log of x because x has units and you can't actually do that. Uh, but if I have a, a differential, I can rewrite that as this. So the magnetic flux is going to be equal to mu naught over 4 pi 2 i s. Now I can say natural log of the final, let's see, this is going to be this minus this, so it's going to be. Uh, r1 plus h over r1. Now I have the magnetic flux as a function of just the current, right? Because that's the only thing that's going to change. Let's just double check the units, right? Um, magnetic flux should be, no, I think we're OK. I'm not going to check the units. So that's that. Now I can take the derivative of this, right? So now I can find the EMF. And I'm going to call it the EMF because I don't care about the direction. So the EMF is going to be equal to, net, again, I don't care about the direction, negative DDT of the flux. So now, what changes with time in my flux? Well, the only thing that changes in time is I. So it's just going to be the derivative of I with respect to time. So this is going to be mu naught over 4 pi. And then I get 2s natural log of R1 plus H over R1 times the derivative of the current with respect to time. If the current is changing at a constant rate, now this is great because now I could have I equals some weird function like I0 E to the negative T over tau, and I could just you know take the derivative of that. It doesn't really matter, right? But in this case, I have I equals some constant I0 times T. No, I0 times t over r, the rate. It doesn't really matter. The derivative of this, I can write di dt as delta i 
over delta T. So this is going to be uh, 1.5 amps minus 0 over 0 0.05 seconds. And that's this up here. So really, I'm, I can find the EMF. Because I know mu naught over 4 pi is 10 to the negative 7th. 2 is 2. I know S. I know the natural log of that. So I, I know all this stuff. Okay. Now I just need to find the current. So I can say I equals EMF over R. So that's going to be whatever value this is divided by 100 ohms. And that's my induced current. Okay. Let's calculate this and then I'll come back and say what direction it's going to be. So I'm going to switch over to Python because you know I'm a huge Python fan and uh, it's just easier to work that way. So computer, there we go. Okay, let's first start off with our constant. I'll call it Km equals uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 7. Um, that's my mu naught over 4 pi. And then I need uh, I0 equals 0. I1 equal, I, I call it I2 equals 1.5. Um, let's say R1, I didn't give values for those. I guess I need to pick some values. So let's say R1 is, I'm thinking of my wire, I'm like, I want to be kind of close, let's say 0 0.01 centimeter, one centimeter away. Uh, H equals 0 0.015, S equals uh, 0 0.02, making up stuff here. Um, DT equals 0 0.05. What else do I have in there? R1H. I think I got it. Okay, so let's calculate EMF. EMF. I'm just. This is the nice thing about Python. I can just type in my expression here. I don't really need to calculate EMF. I don't care about the EMF. So I'm just going to type that in as uh, Km. That's the, the mu naught over 4 pi times 2 times S times the natural log. Uh, in Python, uh, log is the natural log, not the log base 10. And this is going to be R1 plus H divided by R1 times, uh, let's just write this as I2 minus I0, I0, which is 0. Oops, not, not an emoji. I don't want emoji. I don't know how that came up. I0 divided by DT. So that's my EMF. Now I can calculate the current. Uh, I need R. R equals 100 ohms. So I equals e EMF divided by R. I can print that. Induced I equals I amps. Let's run it. So, oh, that's really tiny. Okay, let's just see if I <clears throat> in change this time interval. Uh, five hundredths of a second is kind of large, so it's maybe a thousandth of a second. It's still tiny. Okay, well, it's a tiny area, right? Um, let's make that even smaller and a bigger current, say 5 amps. Okay, it's still tiny. <laughs> uh, I guess I could make the resistance smaller, and that would make it bigger too, but I think that's good. Now let's talk about the direction of this induced current, and then we'll be done with this problem. Uh, back over here. Okay. <clears throat> So the idea is that this changing current is going to induce a current over here. That current is going to also make a magnetic field. So the key here is that the induced current makes a magnetic field that opposes the change in flux. That's a lot right there. Okay. But let's first talk about the change in flux, the direction of the change in flux, delta phi b. So it goes from no flux, because there's no current, to flux that way. So delta phi b is that way. That's the change in flux is that direction. Now this is going to make a magnetic field and it has to make a magnetic field uh, b induced is going to be like this. It has to be in the opposite direction. So it has to be this way. So now which direction would the current in this loop be to make a magnetic field like that? Well I can again use my right hand rule. If I let my fingers curl in the direction of the current I get a magnetic field this way. Okay. And so that would be I induced would be this way. What if I turn off? What if I turn off the wire? What if I go from current of 1.5 to 0? In that case, I would have the initial flux be in, and then the final flux would be 0. So that would actually be a change in flux of coming this way, and the current would be induced in the opposite way 
uh, so the current would go the other way. So when you turn it on, it makes the current go on this way. When you turn off, the current goes the other way. And that is how you calculate that. Now, and it would be fun to do a problem uh, where to put my oh, where i is some function like that. You just take the derivative of it. Since the spatial part, the the flux just depends on the spatial part of the magnetic field. If there's a time component there too, uh, you can first do the integral. That's not a closed integral, right? Because it's not a closed flux. Uh, and then take the derivative. In this case, we just used a constant change, so it's pretty easy. But there's that. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say that the problem that I want to do um, is this. What if I have like a loop? And then uh, let's put the loop right here on the x axis. And then I have a bigger loop like that some distance away. So it's not an easy situation, right? Looking from the side, here's my one loop and here's my other loop. And I change the current in this loop. What's the induced current over here? It's not an easy problem because the magnetic field due to this looks like this. It's not constant, so you can't, it's not easily uh, integrated. Uh, but you could do it numerically, and I think that'd be fun. So numerically, I'd calculate the magnetic field at each of these locations due to that, and then multiply it by some small uh, square area, or I could do this as a box. And then you could add up all those contributions of B dot DA and find the magnetic flux, and then find the change in flux to induce, find the induced current. That'd be kind of fun. And a similar thing would be this. What if I have a wire and a circular loop? Uh, in this case, it's a harder integral to do, but you do the same idea. You could break this into long pieces like that of length dx. And the only thing is the size, the, the height of them changes as you move further away. So it'd be a more complicated integral, but not impossible. So those are homework problems for you if you want. Okay, I'll talk to you guys later.